We do welcome you this morning. Uh, you know, it's a sort of gloomy, rainy morning out there, but we, we need the rain. It's that time of year, and so we appreciate what God provides for us, and we're glad that you are here uh, to, to worship with us. Uh, you can look through the bulletin and, uh, and see some of the... Uh, some of the announcements there uh, for this week. There's a Music and Worship Commission meeting uh, on April 13th. Uh, and then on the 15th, on Thursday, we have our Spring Council meeting. Uh, all attenders are welcome to come and be a part of that meeting. So uh, we, we invite you to that. Um, there will be children dedicated this morning, but that will be in the, in the second service, uh, not in in this service, um, so uh, sorry, <laughs> we'll, we will have more of those services upcoming, and they will be in a, a number of different services. So uh, you'll have opportunity, whether we, whichever service you're at, to uh, to be part of those. Um, I believe I believe that is is it for this morning in terms of, of announcements. Uh, do look through your bulletin in case I have missed something that uh, needs to be on your radar screen. Our preparation thought this morning is, Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. Will you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning, and it's time to come into your house and gather together and worship and praise your holy name. We thank you that you are the only God there is, the only God we need, because you are such an awesome God. We pray that you would be with us this morning, that you would um, speak to us through your Holy Spirit, that you would um, move in our hearts, that we would, would learn and, and grow and be changed this morning drawn closer to you. I have your way in all that we say and in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Their opening hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. The words will be on the screen.
thought that was kind of appropriate since we just had this script. Before I, I start today's message, I'm going to put in a, a book, club, book plug. This is not my book. This is an old book. This book is so old, it is almost as old as I am. Uh, it is called The Knowledge of the Holy by A.W. Tozer. Uh, you're going to hear me quote from him several times this morning. If you, if you want a book, if you want something to really dig into the character and nature of God, uh, I would highly recommend that book. It is still being used 
even though it is old, uh, precisely because it is, it is kind of a, a seminal book on, on the knowledge of God. Um, so, again, I'll be quoting from him a number of times this morning. I don't apologize for that, but uh, I, hope, uh, I hope you will enjoy what you, you hear. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would guide my words and my thoughts this morning, as well as all of our thoughts, that you'd be, be working in our minds and in our spirits, especially as we think on you and, and what an awesome God you are. I pray that you would just, through your spirit, reveal even more of your character, uh, more of your awesomeness, that we might truly appreciate what an incredible God we have. In Jesus' name I pray. There's an old song by Phillips Craig and Dean entitled A Friend Called Grace. Uh, I may have referred to it before. I, I may have even played it for you before. The, the first verse refers to the woman who was caught in adultery from John chapter 8. And then the second verse kind of brings the song into the present. It says the courtroom crowd grew quiet and still as the white-robed judge called truth appeared. And the ring of the gavel brought a fierce debate as the players of eternity decided my fate. In the light of truth, all could clearly see the facts made the trial mere formality. And my accusers stood with bated breath, confident conviction would end in death. But from the blood-stained cross to the witness stand, walked a man with hope in his nail-scarred hands. The words he spoke brought me sweet release. He whispered, I have a friend that you need to meet. And then returns to the chorus, let me introduce you to a friend called Grace. It's a wonderful song about God's grace. But there's a phrase there in the second verse that really it caught my attention. And I've never really been able to shape it. It's the players of eternity decided my fate. Now, I don't believe in fate in, as that, in terms of the way that word is normally used. But it was more the describing of, of God and, and Jesus Christ and by extension the Holy Spirit along with Satan as the players of eternity. The players of eternity who play a great role in determining our eternal destiny. So this morning I, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to start a six-part series called The Players of Eternity. And this morning I'm just going to start with God the Father. Next week I'll probably talk about Satan and then uh, that's not a favorite topic, but sometimes we need to, we need to talk about, about him and, and, and what he's doing in our world. And then I'm thinking of three messages on Jesus and one on the Holy Spirit, though not necessarily in that order. Once I started thinking about this series back in January, it seemed to me like we kept bumping into the attributes of God, even in messages that were going in a much different direction. Even last week, in addressing the life of Christ, who, who revealed the heart of the Father. We talked about a perfect life, a, a powerful life, and a compassionate life. Now, in checking through a number of sources, I came up with no less than 27 attributes of God. And I intend to cover all 27 this morning. Really, Pastor David? Yes, really. And I believe that when we're done here this morning, that each one of you will able, be able to elaborate on all 27. Really, Pastor David? No, not really. Actually, while I probably will mention 27 attributes this morning, they will be grouped into to four headings, four sort of, of super attributes. And if you can name at the end of the service those four attributes and maybe just understand a little bit more about them, I will be thrilled. I'll even give you these four up front. God is transcendent, God is powerful, God is holy, and God is personal. First, God is a transcendent God. You may not have heard this word used as descriptive of God before, but it's a great word, especially as, as a category of other attributes. A.W. Tozer uses this word transcendent, and he defines it this way. He is exalted 
far above the created universe, so far above that human thought cannot imagine. This exaltation is a subject of, of many of the Psalms. And it leads right into a whole group of attributes that defy our imagination. God is eternal, without beginning or end, existing from eternity past to eternity present. I'm guessing that's not news to you. Yet it's so totally foreign to everything else that we know. Even our souls, which will go on forever, had a beginning. Everything we know has a beginning, and most has an end. Some use the term self-existence. God has no origin. That's a concept that applies only to created things. Tozer refers to God as the one who is the cause of all, but himself is the cause of none. The one who is the cause of all, but himself is the cause of none. This eternal existence outside the context of time is wonderfully and simply described in, in God's response to Moses. I am that I am. We also have the term infant. Infant. God is not, not only outside the context of time, He is outside the context of space or any other limits. There is no end to His presence. God is in every sense limitless. We should never put limits on Him. These lead to very, several very obvious points. He is the only God. He is the only God. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I myself am He. There is no God beside me. I put to death and I bring to life. I have wounded and I will heal. And no one can deliver out of my hand. Isaiah 43, 10 and 11. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. There is no other rock. There is no other Savior. There is no other fortress. There was no God before Him, and none, none will come after Him. There was no one in a category alongside of God. He is omnipresent. There is nowhere in the vastness of space, nowhere in the physical or spiritual realm where God is not. We're probably all familiar with Psalm 139, 7 and 8. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I take my, make my bed in the depths, you are there. And God is immutable. He does not change in his nature or attributes. 1 Samuel 15, 29. He who is the God of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. And as is also said of the Son, Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In the first chapter of his book, Tozer talks about how important it is to think rightly about God. Joshua Harris, in his book, Dug Down Deep, makes the same point with this story. He, he knew a, a very bright and intelligent young lady who was in college. But one day in a conversation, she mentioned that she had just learned that the stars in the sky were really far away. Before that, she thought they were just tiny specks of light just over her head. She was amazed at this discovery. By the way, in his book, he points out clearly that she was a redhead, so don't show, throw shade at, at some other color of hair. Okay? <laughs> but Harris continues, if you were to ask me why it matters that we study the doctrine of God, I'd say for the same reason that it's worth knowing that the stars are not tiny pinpricks of light just above our heads. When we know the truth about God, it fills us with wonder. If we fail to understand His true character, we'll never be amazed by Him. We'll never feel small as we stare up at Him. We'll never worship Him as we ought. We'll never run to Him for refuge or realize the great love He's shown in the measureless distance He bridged to rescue us. He's an amazing God. Second, God is a powerful God. We're probably all familiar with the term omnipotent. God has all power. God has at His command all the power in the universe. He can do any one thing just as easily as any other thing. And, and he, never, he never does anything that requires effort that needs to be replaced. Is anything too hard for God? No, nothing's hard at all. He is the Creator. 
which speaks to his power and more. And he continues to create. Isaiah 44, 24. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things. Who alone stretched out the heavens. Who spread out the earth by myself. And Revelation 51. 51 but it, there's, there's 21 chapters in, in Revelation. If you look at your uh, outline, it, it references uh, Revelation 51. It's Revelation 21. Revelation 21, 5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. He simply speaks things into being. God not only has all power, he has all knowledge. He is omniscient, which is just as vital. God possesses all the knowledge there is to have. Nothing ever takes him by surprise. No one has ever served as God's instructor or, or advisor. In fact, it's impossible for God to learn everything because he has always known it all. It's amazing to me that, that man in his arrogance has suggested on numerous occasions that we need to update God's standards because we have become enlightened. Enlightened compared to God? I hardly think so. He is all wise. Isn't that the same thing? Not at all. Tozer writes, Wisdom is the ability to devise perfect ends and to achieve those ends by the most perfect means. It sees the end from the beginning, so there can be no need to guess or conjecture. Wisdom sees everything in focus, everything in proper relationship to all, and is thus able to work toward predestined goals with flawless precision. He also notes that when the Bible talks about wisdom in relationship to God, this wisdom is always pure and loving and good. All of this leads to the fact that God is sovereign, which is to say that he rules over his entire creation. He has absolute freedom and authority to carry out his plans. We sometimes struggle to, to reconcile God's authority and, and our freedom in terms of, of prayer, salvation, and personal responsibility. But it should come as no surprise that we can't fully comprehend all of that given such an awesome God. In Jeremiah 32, we read, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. O oh, great and powerful God, whose name is the Lord Almighty, great are your purposes and mighty are your deeds. Last under this heading, and it almost goes without saying, God is self-sufficient. There is nothing that God needs from, from you or I. He has life and everything else that he needs within himself. Many years ago, pastor and author John Ortberg what was walking along a beach in, in Southern California with a couple of church friends. They walked past a bar where a, a fight had spilled out into the streets, kind of like in, in, an, old, in an old Western. Several guys were, were beating up on another guy, and he was bleeding from the forehead. They made a very weak attempt to break up the fight. Hey, you guys, cut that out, which didn't do much good. Then all of a sudden, the guys who had been beating up on the other guy stopped and started to slink away. Ortberg didn't know why until he turned and looked behind him. Out of the bar had come the biggest man he'd ever seen. He was like six feet seven, maybe 300 pounds, probably 2% body fat. They called him Bubba, not to his face, but afterwards when they talked about it. And Bubba didn't say a word, he just stood there and flexed. You could tell he was hoping they would try and have a go at him. All of a sudden, Ortberg's attitude changed. And he said to these guys, you better not, I better not let catch you around here again. He had a different, he became a different person because he had a great big bug. He was ready to confront with resolve and firmness. He was released from anxiety and fear. He was filled with boldness and confidence. He was ready to help somebody who needed helping. He was ready to serve where serving was required. Why? Because he had a great big bug. He was convinced that he was not alone and that he was safe. A big God can make all the difference in our lives. Third, God is a holy God. Revelation 4.8 reads, Each of the four living creatures had six wings. 
and was covered with eyes all around, even under his wings. Day and night they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is to come. That threefold repetition of the word holy is the strongest statement made in all of Scripture about any attribute in any attribute of God. It's also repeated in Isaiah 6 3. And it's a way of emphasizing just how holy he is. We might say he is holy to the max. He is completely sacred. There is nothing common or profane about him. There is no shadow of darkness or turning. God is also righteous. It is impossible for him to do or cause anything that is wrong. In him lies the absolute standards by which right and wrong will be judged because he is the righteous judge. And yes, by the way, there are absolute standards. God cannot abide anything that is unrighteous, anything that is not of the same nature as he himself. Right along with that, God is, excuse me, God is perfect. He is without sin. He is not only perfect in conduct, but he's perfect in terms of completion. Jesus told his followers, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That is quite a standard to live up to, is it not? God is veracity. There's a word you don't hear too often. It means absolute truth. It's not only that God knows truth, or that he always tells the truth, which he does, or that you can go to him and learn truth. God is truth. No other source can make that claim. He is the source from which all truth comes. Jesus was the express image of the Father. And many times in the Gospels, he tells his listeners, I tell you the truth. Yet in the upper room, in that moment of intense teaching, he said, I am the truth, along with the way and the life. And God is just. It is impossible for him to do anything that is unfair, either to himself or to human beings. Justice demands payment for wrong. It demands rightful punishment for sins and failures. The wages of sin is death, is the justice of God. And God is faithful. All of God's acts are consistent with his nature. One does not contradict another. He is one harmonious entity, not just a series of isolated traits. God will not and cannot contradict himself. He will not go against that nature. He can't break his word. He can't lie. He can be absolutely trusted. What he says will come to pass. Now let me say one thing at this point. If all we know about God is what we've discussed to this point, you should be terrified. Scared right out of your skin. You should be living in absolute dread of what the future holds for you. Because to stand before God who is powerful as God is powerful, who is eternal as God is eternal, who is holy as God is holy, when you are none of those things, holds no hope of anything but an ending judgment and punishment and eternal separation from Him. Fortunately, we're not done. The message isn't over by any means. Fourth, God is a personal God. Now that may seem like a strange description, but it's vital if we're going to have any hope at all. First, God is an interested party. Now that sounds strange, doesn't it? But it's an important beginning because there are many people who believe in an impersonal God. You know, maybe God created the world and maybe he's actually floating, floating around out there somewhere. But if he is, he certainly isn't concerned about us and our behavior. And he certainly... He certainly doesn't communicate or, or interject himself in our lives and in the things going on in our world. Nothing could be further from the truth. God is not sitting back and just watching things unfold. The history of this world is the history of God reaching out in one form or another to have a people he can call his own, to have a relationship with his prized creation. Taking it a step further, God is good. Now wait, now wait a minute, shouldn't, shouldn't that be under holy? I know a lot of people who love to say, God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. But what does that mean? 
Tozer writes, the goodness of God is that which disposes him to be kind, cordial, benevolent, and full of goodwill toward men. By his nature, he is inclined to bestow blessedness, and he takes holy pleasure in the happiness of his people. Why did God call the children of Abraham out to be his chosen people? Why, does he, why did he die on the cross to open the door of relationship to us who are sinners? Because he is good all the time. Now and, and forever, he is good. In his limitless wisdom, which we already covered, God chose to reveal himself to us as our heavenly father. And that alone speaks volumes about the relationship he wants for us. Now some people object to this character characterization as, excuse me, as being male-centric. My thought is that if God in his infinite wisdom chose to reveal himself to us in that way, we need to leave it alone. Don't mess with it. Of course God is a loving God. As with truth, we're told not only that he loves, but that he is love. And scripture is filled with the examples of love and the description of the nature of God's love. There, there's so much there that we couldn't begin to address it this morning. But God so loved that he sent his son to satisfy his justice, to pay for our sins and open that relationship. And God is merciful. Tozer describes mercy as an infinite and inexhaustible energy within the divine nature which disposes God to be actively compassionate. God understands that our sins demand death, separation from Him. And His justice demands that that price be paid. He doesn't just look the other way. He can't write it off. So by His mercy, by His active compassion, He steps in and pays for our death. He dies in our place. Closer related is God's grace. Tozer describes this as grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. It is by grace that God imputes merit where none previously existed and declares no death to be where one had been before. Not only did God pay for our sins, but he made us his children. He opened to us the riches of his grace, totally undeserved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. And lastly, God is a jealous God. In human experience, jealousy is almost always considered negative. But throughout the Old Testament, God makes it clear many times that he is jealous for his people. Exodus 34, 14 reads, do not worship any other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. That's just one of many examples. Whether it was His chosen people back then or us today, God is jealous of our worship, our devotion, our communication, our service, and our love. And given who He is and what He's done for us, there's nothing negative about that. It's important to remember that God is not a mass of isolated attributes, but one awesome integrated being who displays all of these characteristics as part of his nature. I've not begun to do justice to the fullness of God this morning, and if I took a, 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 month, a year of Sundays to, to dwell on this, I still wouldn't do it justice. But I want to leave you with this question this morning. Does your life, does you, my life, give witness to the fullness of God? Do our lives give witness to the fullness of God? I know the answer for me is not even close. We have much work to do to live up to the fullness of our mighty God. What do you pray for? Heavenly Father, we are thankful again that we serve an awesome God. A God who, who even when we, we take the time and, and go through all that we've gone through this morning, we haven't begun to touch on, on just the incredibleness of your nature. The unfathomableness of who you are. So 
that through your spirit, help us to grasp more of who you are and live out in our lives the, the reality of the God that we serve. In Jesus' name I pray. Closing him is love what to do. Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forever.